This was a time of evil leaders, of corrupt governors, of corrupt and even evil priests working in the temple, you know, leading the Jewish people as well. And into that corruption and into that scene comes John the Baptist, the son of the righteous priest Zechariah, with a message of good news, that the Messiah is coming and that salvation is at hand. Right? So it's just a powerful, powerful portrait of the time when John the Baptist arose on the scene. Sometime around 29 or 30 AD, John comes onto the scene, and this is what happens. He goes out into the desert, he goes out into the wilderness, and he begins preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, there are lots of things we could say about John. Whole books have been written about him. For our purposes here, I just want to highlight one element, the geography of John's ministry. Why does John go out into the wilderness? Why does he go into the River Jordan to preach this baptism of repentance? Why not go to Jerusalem? I mean, if you want to get crowds of people, if you want to get attention, if you want to call more people to repentance, don't you go to the city? Why do you go to the, to the wilderness or the desert? And the answer to that question is found in the quotation from the book of Isaiah that Luke gives you here. This is a quotation of a prophecy of the new Exodus, when God is going to save his people in the future like he saved them in the past. He's going to make a way through the desert and lead them home to the promised land in ways similar to the path through the desert that he made at the time of Moses and the Exodus, where he led the people out of Egypt, through the desert, and then to the river Jordan. And if you're familiar with the book of Joshua, you'll recall that in Joshua 4 and 5, it says that the first exodus from Egypt came to an end when Joshua and the 12 tribes passed through the waters of the river Jordan and entered into the earthly promised land of Canaan. So what Isaiah says in this oracle is that in the future, there's going to be a new exodus. That's one of the categories that they describe the future age of salvation with as a new exodus. So John the Baptist, as the prophet of the age of salvation, is also a prophet of the new exodus, a prophet of the new way of salvation that God is going to make with the coming of the Messiah, right, that Isaiah had spoken about in his oracles. Now, um, every time I talk about this topic, it's so tempting to just open up this giant can of worms because this is what I wrote my dissertation about. It's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, and I think it's one that really helps us get into Advent in particular. Uh, but for reasons of space and time, let me just make one quick point here about the new Exodus. You know, what is this new Exodus? Well, there are two images that get used for it in the Old Testament. One is making the way through the desert, like we see here in the book of the prophet Isaiah. You know, God carving a path to the promised land, just like he had done at the time of Moses. But there's another image that gets used for the new exodus in the Old Testament, and it's the image of the ingathering of the exiles, right? So in the first century AD, although people don't often think about this, the Jewish people had a problem. Um, and the problem was that over the centuries, the majority of the 12 tribes of Israel had been scattered to the four winds. So for example, in the 8th century BC, the Assyrian Empire came in and exiled 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel in what was called the Assyrian exile. That happened in 722 BC. And then a couple centuries later, the Babylonians came in and they exiled the remaining two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. They brought them to Babylon in 587 BC in what was known as the Babylonian exile. Every first century Jew would have known that the Babylonian exile, the second exile, came to an end in the fifth century BC. Whenever the Persians allowed the Jews, the Judahites and the Benjaminites, to come back and rebuild the temple and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. That was the end of the Babylonian exile. But every first century Jew would have also known that the Assyrian exile, the ten northern tribes who had been scattered amongst the Gentiles, had never come home. This was the origin of the legend of the lost ten tribes of Israel. The idea that these ten tribes remained scattered and mixed amongst the Gentiles. But that one day when the Messiah came, those lost tribes of Israel would actually return to the promised land in the ingathering of the exiles, which is described by some of the prophets as the new exodus. 
So the new exodus is really the gathering in of those lost tribes of Israel. All of that background is really essential for understanding the first reading today. So just like the reading from the gospel was about the new exodus, the reading from the Old Testament today is about the in gathering of the exiles. So if you turn with me, the Old Testament reading for the second Sunday of Advent is from a book that's only in the Catholic Old Testament. It's the little known book of Baruch. Right? So if you look at the Old Testament, Baruch was the scribe of the prophet Jeremiah. So he would have lived in the 6th century before Christ. And there's a little book that was often circulated as an appendix to the book of Jeremiah called the book of Baruch. And in chapter 5, verse 1 through 9, Baruch gives a prophecy of the new exodus. It's a prophecy of the ingathering of all the scattered children of Israel. But in this prophecy, he depicts the ingathering as children coming home to their mother, with Jerusalem being depicted as a mother waiting for her children to come home. So this is, it's a beautiful prophecy. This is what it says. Take off the garment of your sorrow and affliction, O Jerusalem, and put on forever the beauty of the glory of God. Put on the robe of righteousness from God. Put on your head the diadem of the glory of the everlasting. For God will show your splendor everywhere under heaven. For your name will forever be called by God, peace of righteousness and glory of godliness. Arise, O Jerusalem, stand upon the height and look toward the east. And see your children gathered from west and east at the word of the Holy One, rejoicing that God has remembered them. For they went forth from you on foot, led away by their enemies. But God will bring them back to you, carried in glory, as on a royal throne. For God has ordered that every high mountain and the everlasting hills be made low, the valleys filled up to make level ground, so that Israel may walk safely in the glory of God. The woods and every fragrant tree have shaded Israel at God's command. For God will lead Israel with joy in the light of his glory, with the mercy and the righteousness that come from him. All right, so notice something about that prophecy. Baruch says to Jerusalem, look up, lift up your eyes, arise, and see your children coming home, not just from the east, but from the west. Now, that doesn't just mean every direction. It also means the ingathering of the Assyrian exiles, the ingathering of all the tribes of Israel. Because the Babylonian exile only went east. It didn't go west. It went to the east. But the Assyrians actually scattered the children of Israel all over the place, north, south, east, and west. So what Baruch is describing there is the time of the Messiah, when there was this belief that all 12 tribes, not just two, all 12 tribes would be gathered together again and brought to a new Jerusalem, a more glorious Jerusalem, and a new temple that would be greater even than the Temple of Solomon, a Jerusalem that would be greater than the Jerusalem of Solomon, right? That would put on the robe of righteousness and wear this diadem of God's glory. All right. That's what John the Baptist is announcing in the wilderness. That's what John the Baptist goes out to the River Jordan to proclaim, and that's why John the Baptist was so popular amongst the Jews of his day. Because he was saying to them, the time of the ingathering of the exiles is at hand. And in order to get ready for the coming of the Messiah, you need to put away your sins. You need to uh, turn away from life of sin and turn to a life of grace. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's the condition that makes Israel ready to meet her Messiah. Because at the end of the day, remember, what was it that led Israel into exile? What scattered them amongst the nations? It was sin. It's sin that exiles us from God. It's sin that separates us from God. It's sin that, in a sense, drives us away from the promised land that God made to be our home. And so what John's doing is saying to the people, if you repent, the, the age of salvation will come and people will be able to come home and the new exodus will take place, the ingathering of the exiles, and God's going to make a new way in the desert and bring his children home. All right. And if you have any doubts that that's the case, think about what happens after John's ministry, Jesus comes onto the scene. What's the first thing he does? How many apostles does he gather around him? Not one, not two, not three, not ten, but twelve. Showing that he is going to bring about the end gathering of the twelve tribes. 
not by an earthly return to the earthly promised land. Jesus doesn't, you know, send his guys out and say, bring every Israelite you find amongst the Gentiles back to the earthly Jerusalem and the earthly temple. No, no, no. This is going to be a new Jerusalem. It's going to be a new temple. It's going to be a new ingathering of the exiles to a new Jerusalem. And that explains the response oral psalm for today. 